Hi. I feel super pleased that you're all here. I'm also totally understanding that nothing else is on, but I, I, <laughs> I'm going I'm to take what I can get. Uh, my name is Johanna Kolion, and people call me Jok. Uh, when I was a baby, I was dropped into a magic cauldron of complex data. And uh, since then, my magic skill has been organizing information. And that means that I'm pretty confident about my opinions about stuff that I really, really care about, like LARP design that I thought about systematically for literally decades. And, uh, and I often <laughs> do like these constructive talks where I talk about the principles of LARP design, which I feel that it is super important for all of us to share. And I know that that's uh, appreciated and everything. Um, I, uh, uh, I felt uh, this morning that it could be funny to do like a joke about my brain encased in, in this hat and go like, this is where the magic happens. <laughs> and I have two very important things to say about that. One is that on my character sheet, uh, my skill points uh, were balanced with a very low tolerance uh, for alcohol and sleep deprivation. <laughs> <laughs> So, so probably and that's going to be a, a especially hard to prove today. And in addition, this isn't even my magic hat. Uh, this hat uh, belongs to uh, a friend who yesterday, when another friend, they don't even know each other, but the other friend uh, didn't have a costume for the party. And I said, wow, well, shouldn't we get you like a costume for this party? And this one friend left where we were and went like several floors down to find an extra hat to give it to this other friend who wore it all evening. And then uh, this morning when I woke up, the magic hat was hanging on my doorknob because he didn't know where to return it. And this will be relevant later because of course it's not here the magic happens. It's here the magic happens because friends give other friends magic hats. And. Uh, this will be relevant later, very soon. So uh, I'm going to take you on a little journey on, on the, the talk I was going to give and then the talk you're actually going to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had this idea that like, maybe I've been so fucking constructive for 25 years so I could just be angry and hungover on a Sunday and give like, a talk about everything that's wrong instead of just doing things right. And I thought that was funny. And I thought like a month after a program deadline, and I'm sure I'm going to figure this out by then because I have a lot of opinions, as you know. Uh, and I'm just going to do a sexy title and everything else will sort itself out. I call it Cardinal Sins of LARP Design. As you may have noticed here, the design is already gone. You will notice why. Uh, but I, I think in all honesty, when I sat down to prepare my slides, totally this week, uh, but earlier this week, I was like, do I mean Cardinal Sins really? Or do I just mean shit that makes me angry? <laughs> And I've, unfortunately, I'm an overthinker, so I'd be, okay, but what is a cardinal sin? Like, okay, the cardinal sins are, it's just another name for the seven deadly sins, and the seven deadly sins are lust, pride, greed, wrath, envy, gluttony, and sloth. And those, of course, are always in relationship to some virtues, like it's the negative aspect of some normative virtue system, right? And I, I think we can just say, based on, on yesterday and based on our experience of this community, that lust, perhaps, is not uh, a deadly sin in this environment. I mean, of course, lust for life, lust for experiences, uh, in the broadest possible sense. But let's be real, like pride, <laughs> greed, wrath, envy, gluttony, and sloth are actually like pretty good universal uh, sins still. And then, uh, then the overthinker in me is like, wait a minute, but is it a little bit prideful that I would be like, I personally will now tell you what the deadly sins of LARP design are? Because I thought it would be funny. Um, so you can see how already I'm working myself into a problem. But I sit down and do my slides, and my slides include things like this. Adding actions just to illuminate your... I, I had like old slides, I just picked a little selection of the kind of tone that I was originally going for. Uh, adding actions just to illuminate your cool fiction. Now you can see how funny this would have been, by the way, because, <laughs> of course... <laughs> Because what, what, what this means is things like you have created a LARP and there's a world that is happening inside your head and now you want to present that world as completely as possible in your LARP. So you're thinking, oh, this is a society and people are doing things in this society and they have different tasks for this society to function. For instance, uh, some holes will need digging and some floors will need sweeping. And, and you make sure to, to like um, enhance the completeness of the simulation of the image in your mind. You put these 
functions into the LARP with very little or no consideration for whether it is in fact interesting or meaningful for a player to dig that hole or, or, or wipe those floors. And by the way, I've been to LARPs where it has been and I've been to LARPs where it's not. So it's not, it's not like a thing where you have, to, where that is in itself bad, that of course comes down to the whole uh, uh, adage of, of the, if the verbs in the LARP are disconnected from the themes in the LARP, that is to say, if the, uh, if the writing and the design are not properly balanced, then we all understand the proper balance is that design is everything and writing is just a tool, <laughs> <laughs> then the LARP will not be playable. Um, and now you can already see, this is starting to sound familiar, and then I had other ideas, like making the actions of a small group of characters everyone's LARP ending. Now, this is like, you know, stuff that, I have LARPs that I have played, in, this isn't 90s stuff, this is recent years, like you go to a big LARP, you go on a big journey, and your final two hours is waiting around while some people are solving plot over which you have no uh, influence at all, and also you have no influence over your own experience. I'm like, this is bad, but again, like, <sighs> Is, is this just, am I just talking about playability again? Isn't this in fact the same talk I give every year? Blah, 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 design, blah, 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 playability. And I had like a genuine crisis of confidence on Friday when I was finishing my slides. I thought, I can't do this. Also, I, this whole irony about the, the pride, like, what, uh, I think I'm approaching this all wrong. So I did the only sensible thing in a Knutspunkt environment. If you are a person who drinks alcohol, I took my crisis to the bar. <laughs> I, I talked to a lot of people, but like, what even is, what even is a cardinal sin of LARP? And, and they said, and like I said, because I think I know what they are, and they will all be about playability, <laughs> okay? <laughs> But people were saying like very sort of, to me, random examples like this. Using portraying history as an excuse to exclude characters and actions that in fact existed historically. Which I think we can all agree is messed up and a bit of a cardinal scene. Like it's really shooting yourself in the foot from, from a, like a, a fiction design perspective. And I guess you could say that that definitely limits the playability um, for, for especially certain player categories. But it's still like... I might, did, did the first comment like immediately undermine my whole project? Uh, so I'm like, surely somebody else has uh, a cardinal sin. Yeah, designing a workshop, what do you mean? Designing a workshop instead of designing the workshop that this LARP needs. Yeah, is that like, I guess indirectly that's a playability crime? But like, oh, this is, hmm. Yes, says another person, talking about workshops. Workshops that are in fact briefings, where the distinction, by the way, is that workshop is that some kind of like development is happening, and the briefing is where I am telling you information so that you can be updated on what I have already decided. Um, that's annoying. Yes, and debriefings that are in fact just some time for unfacilitated conversation, which for many LARPs is a totally valid reflection period after the LARP, but for many LARPs, with themes where you've gone into like a lot of design about deep topics, that's actually not a very good debriefing because as we all know, the contextualization and the learning of the LARP experience happens after the actual runtime has ended. Yes, said another person in the bar, but can we also not show a heavy documentary 10 minutes after the end of runtime? Because then at that point I really do need to breathe and I'm like, okay, we are getting into specifics which I feel are drifting away from my unified theory of playability. <laughs> So now the crisis of confidence had like gone into a complete crisis of just like knowledge, which is once again, I know nothing. <laughs> so I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna ask some experts instead, and many of you will know because <laughs> those experts are sitting in this very room. <laughs> All of you know the answer to this question that none of us I think individually know the answer to, but I know how to organize information. So I decided to get drunk and walk around with my camera and take notes. And, <laughs> and I want to say directly that it is very likely that some of these people are not connected to the right quote. And also some of my notes were completely imp incomprehensible to me even just five minutes after. And some of the pictures, I'm sorry to say, it was no longer possible to use or would never have been possible to use. Not because of your outfits, you all looked fantastic day or night at this convention, you're all beautiful and wise. I uh, may sometimes uh, have had a slightly trembly hand. All right. <laughs> And now these are just gonna come in like 
I want to say like a random order, and that's not true because what I did do this morning was that I spent like one hour just clustering them to see is there, are there patterns here. And, and I would say that there is a pattern that emerges, which is what I should have thought about, you know, months ago when I set the title for this talk, which is what is a sin? You cannot answer the question of what is a sin unless you know what is a virtue. But we don't actually know what the virtues of LARP are, but it is possible clearly for us to answer the question, what is a sin? So what will we find out when we speak to the experts? And now we get to the point where I have no plan and I'm just gonna react to what's on the slides. <laughs> and this is why we are not in fact streaming this, we are recording this because God knows what's gonna come out of my completely filterless brain mouth environment. Okay, not workshopping crucial things is a crime against LARP, a sin against LARP. Making players guess at their function in your LARP. Do you all know what this means? Does it sound familiar? Yeah. So like I probably, in a LARP, my presence there, and in particular the presence of my character, means something. It, you, to you who designed it, it's very clear what that is. My function is to enable certain kinds of information and actions to flow through the LARP and to, to, to be part of creating trajectories that will generate interesting stuff. But this works differently from LARP to LARP, as we all know, and we are, most of us, playing in bespoke LARP communities, which is to say that they are differently in design between different LARPs. So I actually cannot feasibly know how your specific LARP is designed, even with my experience, I cannot know this, uh, so I am often made to guess at what I am actually supposed to achieve as part of the LARP machine, uh, uh, even if I know what my, uh, I as a player am kind of enabled to do. So this is Cardinal Sin, okay. Clustering content onto too few players. A lot of plot or action or agency or potential moves through very few individuals for in-game reasons probably, and or for design reasons or for completely random reasons. But this very rarely works. And I had to put one of my own pet peeves in here because that's like the, the, the underlying problem is assuming all players can distribute play. I think everybody can LARP, but I think that the skill set you need to distribute play, that's one of those ensemble skills that we learned about a few days ago at this convention. Some of us are new and confident players. We are playing the melody of, of our single inf instrument very confidently, but we have not yet come to a point where we are also at the same time able to jam or to conduct or whatever the function of that particular person in that LARP is. And that's a skill set. And here we do a big mistake, which is we will often give a high status character with plot distribution uh, roles to an old confident player who has not LARPed for very long, rather than to a slightly younger player who has perhaps LARPed for 15 years, and I betcha that person is going to be better at distributing play. Not onboarding beginners. Almost every LARP is somebody's first LARP. We're actually not great at helping that person up, out. Not setting a top intensity level for calibrated interactions. Classic <laughs> mistake. You can calibrate as far as you go. No, what you mean as a designer, you can calibrate as far as I can imagine a person would. And I promise you in this room, there are people who would go a lot farther than you can imagine. <laughs> I forgot to take a picture of Mikke, so there's an arrow at him. <laughs> not specifying sex mechanics in a LARP where sex will occur. Like, if you know for a fact that you have made a LARP where, where any kind of intense interaction is uh, gonna be present, like, it would be really useful to help the players not, to not have them improvise how that's gonna be resolved. In fact, I think all of the ones we've seen so far are kind of the same scene, which is setting the players up to fail. You're making unreasonable demands on player capacity, or you are uh, uh, demanding that they are telepaths game design telepaths, not just that they're very good at reading game design, but also they're very good at reading it from inside your brain. And I think a lot of these are also, for this reason, sins against co-creation. So, setting players up to fail is blocking them from co-creating efficiently within your vision and within our shared work. Um, and that suggests to me that there's something there about fucking up co-creation, sorry, messing up co-creation. Making the players guess at your secret vision can also happen on many other uh, layers. 
forcing plot on players, you are making it very clear what your secret vision is. It's not secret at all. This is in fact what everybody will do at this LARP in this order. Now again, this is not like a design normative thing. Linear LARPs can be absolutely fantastic. Scripted, ending, scripted endings can be fantastic. Railroaded LARPs can be fantastic. Scene-based LARP, where almost everything is determined, can be great. But then that's the LARP you have to design. You can't design like a sandbox and at the same time assume that people have to follow the idea that was in your mind. Blaming the players for not doing what, sorry, what you wanted, it should be. Blaming the players for not doing what you, the designer, wanted, right? It happens so often. You know what? If, if the players didn't do what I, the designer, wanted to, them to do, who failed? I, the designer, failed because I did not give them the tools or motivations or information or anything that they needed to do the thing. Or possibly, it wasn't even physically possible to do it on the location. And I will still blame them sometimes. I'm trying not to, but let's not do that. Clearly people are, okay. Connected to this, you see a lot of these cluster because they're, much, they're different aspects of the same thing. Trying to control the participants' experience and emotions. And I think, so the operative word here is control. What's the opposite of that? Uh, Magnar was talking, this I'm summarizing, he was talking uh, for a great deal over this meal about designing work that requires participants to do specific things and to feel specific things. And especially feeling specific things is not necessarily great LARP design. Um, he talked about this Brian Eno quote, which says LARP is not, uh, well, I mean, Brian Eno wasn't talking about LARP, but, but basically the gist is that LARP is not interactive in the way many interactive media are interactive. It's unfinished, right? Uh, and and uh, James was actually saying uh, the, at the same table, I think there's a slide later also, but he was talking about interactive performance design and saying in that con context that this, it's also a sin to assume that the artwork is a text because it's not a text, it's an eco ecology, right? Unfinished, an ecology. The things that the players do mean something. And, and we can guide what the players do in a lot of different ways, and they are all totally valid as long as everybody understands what we're going for, right? And even inside that, the players will need some level of agency, and the, the most important, like the sacred agency, is my feelings. I have to decide what I and my character are feeling in this moment, I feel. Uh, <laughs> overruling player decisions out of pride. Do not retcon shit that happened at your LARP because you failed, unless it is absolutely vital. Retcon means that something has happened and then you overrule it and say this didn't happen. We say this other thing happened instead, right? Do not do that. It's such a heartbreaking thing for the players. Sometimes you designed a LARP where it's necessary to get everything back on, on your track, but then you made a mistake and then you do it very humbly and perhaps invite the players to create a solution together with you that minimizes the, their harm because you will not know exactly what's been going on in their play. All of these I guess our sins against co-creation. And I mean, I, demanding obedience in some way for your artistic vision. Then, like, if you want to demand audience obedience, uh, like maybe uh, be a novelist or go into kink, I'm not sure. Like, <laughs> but, but even there, I think you will be like worried. Like you will be astonished at, at how complex consent is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Obscuring the pacing, yeah, you can see what a, what a well-rested person wrote these slides. Obscuring the pacing of your LARP. So this was also a longer conversation. It was a difficulty that you can, I, I go to a LARP and I'm on a ride, like I'm connecting, I'm trying to play my story, right? And I need to connect my story to the pacing of the LARP somehow so that I'll know like where are the turning points and where, just, just let me, give me some information, some landmarks about the time structure so that I can help you make the best LARP for everybody. It does not have to be transparency. But also, like if there's gonna be a major event on day two of your LARP that changes for the characters what is now important and what is not important, make sure that they know that that type of surprise is coming so that they don't set up their whole play on completely trivial but very interesting character interactions that become irrelevant when the world is ending. Not establishing the tone. This is, of course, a designer side problem. Like, what, what is the tone we're going for? It's not just genre, although that's also very helpful. But so, like, is this lighthearted? Is this serious? What is the range of acceptable tone in this LARP? Making any storyline dependent on a single person. That person's presence, that person's uh, ability to direct play, 
that, you know, all of these, there are so many things where we're, we're hanging everything on one single player is unfair to everybody. Because that person, like, literally could also just go into anaphylactic shock and leave the game area. And then you've made trouble for yourself. LARP democracy. This one is on player side. So this is an old term. Uh, there was a common, common problem in the Nordic social democracies that uh, when we LARP in the feudalistic societies, on the final days, it's no matter how much oppression you're going for, on the final day of the LARP, all of the factions will have a negotiation and we will introduce a social democratic order <laughs> where we uh, rule through consensus which will involve many, very many long meetings for everybody to be heard and no battling at all. <laughs> These are sins against coherence. <laughs> you know, don't, don't do a genre flip uh, on your players in the middle of a LARP. You can't play it. We, we've tried it. You, you know, you think you can do it. No, no. I mean, you're gonna do it anyway, because you, know, you won't believe us, but we have all tried, it's a terrible idea. But sins against coherence can also be smaller. You have to help us, like how do we, where are we? Like what, what, what's the tone that we're going for here? How do we do this together? Of course, on the scene level, like in the play, uh, on the player side, there are some actions that are better or worse, LARPing, breaking the atmosphere, is kind of not not paying attention to what's going on in the room and just like coming in in some totally different tone. There's mission drift in LARPs, different groups, like we're in a very sort of sad and contemplative mood over here and we have been on a kind of light-hearted romp and then these two groups meet and then we're in this tone and they're in this tone and then, you know, there's a little, how do we, how do we find a place where our people can interact without everything breaking? We can also really just like, just, just be, just check, check around the room before you speak sometimes. Uh, not understanding the tone, this is the player side. Sometimes it really is that you didn't stop and think about this as a player, even though it was communicated. Off gaming, it's just like, maybe don't listen. Yeah, I love, I love Daniel Craig too, but let's not talk about James Bond while we should be playing. These also are actually sins against coherence, I think. No target audience. No target audience. <laughs> There could be more of this. I thought it was interesting that two people used the specific same words to mean the specific same thing. Uh, a target audience for your LARP should be larger than you <laughs> and smaller than everyone in the universe. <laughs> this is the acceptable range. Any number between the values myself and everybody is useful. But those two do not work unless it's a single player LARP for you, in which case knock yourself out. <laughs> and this has to do with player selection. Not every LARP is for everybody, so you're going to want the people at your LARP who will enjoy that LARP and who will be able to create the LARP that you want to create with them. Believing a cool location equals a playable location. <laughs> what is beautiful is not always functional. Uh, special, uh, I mean, do a site visit in advance and pay special attention to acoustics and temperature because those are the ones that you're likeliest to miss and those are the ones that are likeliest to fuck you over. I'm sorry about the cursing. In fact, I, I just went ahead and just cut out some words because I, I personally believe that if you believe that cool is the same as playable, that you will often find out that it's not. Sometimes it is, but then it's not going to be based on that, this, like the principle that's going to be coincidence. And I think that these are also kind of sins against, against co-creation. If, if the players are coming in with very different expectations of what the LARP is, so, so that some of them, some players, and like, they will all believe that they are at the right, uh, right LARP and everybody else is an idiot, to be clear. And, and it's you who have failed, it's not them. You have communicated poorly. Often your producer hat, which needs to fill the LARP, uh, gets precedence. And your designer hat, which needs to run the LARP to the players who actually showed up, will hate the producer for getting those players in. It might have been better to cancel or reschedule or shrink the LARP than to run it for the players you, you yourself actively selected. Because co-creation is very difficult when you are trying to co-create different things at the same time. It's often impossible. Not asking for help or canceling when you as an organizer are overwhelmed. Google sunk cost fallacy. Messing up your LARP life balance. This could be I'm running LARPs, so my high school grades are suffering. It could be I'm running LARPs, it cost me only two years of burnout, clinical depression, and my marriage. And I mean, I think we're at a point where most of us don't lose tens of thousands of crowns 
running LARP. <laughs> I can tell you there was 15 years there when that was pretty standard. Overpromising. That's this, this is the high path again. Oh, we're going to do all of these things. I'm sure we're going to do the things um, at the LARP. Come buy the tickets. Yes, we have bought the tickets. Okay, now I'm going to actually make the LARP. I can't actually make all the things that I promised. Expectation management is key. Disappointment is a function of expectation. If your players are disappointed on site, that's not a mistake that they make there or a mistake that you make there. That's a mistake that you made earlier in time when you created for them an expectation that you then cannot deliver. Hiding information like date and time. <laughs> there, for the right players to be able to sign up to your LARP, it's very useful if this type of information is perhaps on the front page. Lack of communication. I was like, okay, this is a good, this is a good one. Players, uh, organizers, uh, everybody. Before, during, after, everything. Okay. <laughs> Big ego. Players or designers? Both. Okay. Uh, believing you are a rock star. Specifically in this example, believing that you as an organizer are a rock star and it means that during the runtime you can choose to do some things that are, are about your ego rather than about the, the event you're running. Uh, I, didn't put to, I, I forgot who said this and it's probably just as well because you know, but uh, like everybody who thinks that they now know which rock stars we're talking about, my list is like 50 people. <laughs> I think these are also, also sins against community. I, I think that, that the things where you as, a, as an organizer break yourself are largely, I mean, in the first hand, they're sins against sustainability and they are sins against your, your self-respect, like and your boundaries. Take care of yourself. People are more important than LARP. And you know what, that, also, that is also true for passionate LARP artists. But I think in, by extension, there's sins against community because when we work in unsustainable ways, we perpetuate this culture that it's okay to break ourselves over a our LARP. And I, 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 I say this as a person who has also gone through those mental health issues and burnouts. You know, a lot of us have. You would not believe the number of people in, in this room who have been on sick leave, not be necessarily because of their work stuff, but be because of their LARP stuff, not exclusively. But you know what? We don't get to decide what else happens in our lives the same year we're running that event. So you have to have some margins. You need them. And also, just quite selfishly, like I want each of you to take care of yourself, but I also want to play your, your LARPs. So I can't afford for any of you on these skill levels to burn yourself out. You have to take care of yourself so that I can play your third LARP and your fifth LARP and your 15th LARP. Okay? Okay. Sins against community. Inappropriate content in kids' LARPs. <laughs> I wish I had asked more questions. <laughs> Making players design your LARP. I should probably have put more, more words in on this one. Uh, so it's a totally valid decision to, have, to create the process where the participant group together creates big chunks, or perhaps everything, of the LARP that you are running. Then you design a process of how that collective design is going to happen. And that can be a wonderful way to do much more creative things than you can individually do and to create a lot of ownership. This is not that. This is when you did not ask for help. Uh, or you did not ask anybody to suddenly check your design, or you just didn't think, or you didn't visit the location, or any of the billion other things that can go wrong. And now we're at the LARP, and your LARP is not working for whatever reason. It might not be your fault, but still your responsibility. And now the players have to design it for you. Sometimes they will do it without saying anything, <laughs> because they can see that you are on the verge of a breakdown. And this is actually wonderful, but also kind of shit, because then it's possible you don't understand that the reason the LARP work wasn't actually w you. <laughs> it was that they, they embraced your vision and wanted to make it work around you and also for them because at that point, you know, everybody wants the LARP to work. But it can also be that you just like start screaming at your players as though they are team members, which again is not a great idea like for, <laughs> for, for doing that co-creation thing. Generally, this is a, a, an audience base, a, a community where if you say, we have been overwhelmed. We would need help with these things. Or could you take charge of these people? We'll step up and they'd be happy to do so. Um, but kind of scrambling and pretending like it was the plan all along for the players to do all of this stuff. Or not even noticing the labor that they are putting in. That's not great. 
on a more top level, not being prepared, <laughs> not being prepared to run the LARP, not being prepared uh, to play the LARP, we've all been underprepared, and I think nobody has ever gone into a LARP in the history of LARP and felt like, I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> so this is clearly a scale. Um, and it, but if you have very little time as a player, just figure out, try to figure out, again, like the design side thing, like what is the function of my role? Like what, is, what do I have to achieve for this LARP not to break down? Make sure you fi figure out what those are, when in doubt, ask an organizer. And then make sure you deliver on that and everything else you can probably make up on the fly and you'll have a great LARP, right? If you're an organizer, be prepared to run the LARP. And I cannot stress this enough. The most important investment you can do in player safety and the most important investment you can do in the artistic quality of your LARP as run is getting sleep before and during runtime. The second most important now that I'm lecturing with my lecturing tone, the second most important investment you can make in safety and in the artistic quality of your LARP is to make sure the players get sleep during runtime. I cannot stress this enough. There's a lot of science behind this, or a lot of experience. You can, make, you can make things happen late at night and in the morning that will make them feel as though everything is super intense, but actually you make sure that the structure of the LARP is such that everybody gets minimum six hours and it's possible to get eight. They will be, they will, they will be so much better co-creators and so much safer too. The players will handle it between them in a constructive and inclusive manner. <laughs> it could be a bunch of things. And I'm not meaning to say that every conflict, everything should always be handled, every issue must be handled by an organizer, because that's also not feasible. But a lot of the times, if, I, I'm just saying like, if you hear yourself saying this, or I mean, the person in the picture is saying, if you hear yourself saying this, step back and think, what are the light, likely outcomes of letting this be handled by some people who are not you, with no, zero oversight from you, or zero facilitation from you, whatever it is. And this could be make sure that they don't starve, or it could be handle an interpersonal conflict, like there are ranges. I think a lot of these that we've just seen uh, are about breaking your contract with the players. And this one is super tricky because these contracts are implicit. And they are based on assumptions that are based on like all the participants and your experience, but are very, very rarely like actually verbalized. So that's a, that's a challenge. But this, again, like, this stuff kind of connects to this idea of making unreasonable demands on player capacity. Like LARPing is very hard. Just being, just being in the process of being a character and steering, you know, and creating cool scenes for everybody and being, doing the ensemble work as well, that in itself can take up full bandwidth of individual human. Um, and then the players and you need to rest in some kind of understanding of who's in charge of what. <laughs> Like, what is my responsibility now? And that does actually matter, like, or, or uh, vary a little bit between different LARPs. And I think we could all get better. And I don't know how to do this because I learned this today while organizing your, your, your comments. Thanks for that. Like, this is, I don't know the answers. You just told me that this is a question. But clearly, we need to be better, I think, somehow at verbalizing, like, who's in charge of what during runtime, so, like, on a very basic level. Uh, and uh, let's talk about that. Uh, and the reason, of course, this is important is that if we don't do it, it's a sin against co-creation. Dance card LARPing, lovely term I learned this week. It means that I go to a LARP with a mental dance card, which says, a dance card was a thing they had historically at balls, where I will, I will be dancing the waltz with you, and I will be dancing the shottis with you, or whatever. And then I have planned out scenes. I don't know why I did that in a Swedish accent. I do know why I did that in a Swedish accent. Uh, then, I have planned, then I have planned out scenes. And I'm just gonna be playing with these folks and I'm shutting myself off from the rest of the LARP mentally because they are my backdrop for my epic story with these pre-selected cool players or lovely players or people that I trust or people that I've known for many reasons. And I shut myself off from actually engaging with the work. That is in all likelihood absolutely not how your characters function in the LARP was designed to, to contribute to the whole, and you are very likely to break some of the interaction machine for the collective if you do this. Hitting on people in character. <laughs> Trying to transfer in-game relations after into real life. Uh, my bad language, not theirs. Not respecting a consent. Which, to be clear, is like also a life crime. It's not just a LARP crime. <laughs> Not participating. 
We had talk, we had words. I mean, we had many words. They were not uh, aggressive words, but like, what does that mean? Yeah, but like on some fundamental level, you're the LARP, <laughs> and, like, and, and, and there are reasons why you may not be able to participate, and then you should step out, but there's some kind of, there's some level of like, you have to get into it to get something out of it. You have to participate. And almost any problem that you have, in all likelihood, it's the, the solution to that problem as a player will be either participating in a different way or more, or, or negotiating, like uh, speaking to some, to some other players or to an organizer about how to take away the obstacle that is stopping you from participating, right? But you have to kind of be in charge of that because the other people at this venue are not inside your head. And this, I think, have to do with breaking your contract with the other players, and that also is an implicit contract. And these are, are contracts of participation and co-creation, and they are, they are also just like human interaction contracts. And here too, we are maybe not great at verbalizing like what are the functional, which parts, which parts of participation in this LARP design are not optional. I think we can do better there. Vampire syndrome, a term I learned yesterday, love it. Vampire syndrome is when all the characters who control the plot in any way go into a room and shut the door. <laughs> leaving your pre-written relations stranded, just ignoring them or like pretend checking in with them and then just ignoring them for the rest of the LARP in a way that blocks their play. Also, I think breaking your contract with the other players, right? Also a sin against co-creation. Wanting to be the hero, playing for your own sake, playing to win, not taking others' needs into account, forgetting you have co-players, Big ego, lack of, oops, lack of communication, sense of co-creation. <laughs> also, yeah, I mean, I'll, in the long term, I think a sin, sin against uh, community and a sin against your own experience in the end. Like, it's, a lot of us needed to move through this phase to learn how to actually LARP, and isn't it much better <laughs> now that we know how? Um, not documenting anything. <laughs> Clearly a sin against community. <laughs> so, through the very scientific process of walking around randomly with my phone and asking people that happened to stand in front of me, I think we have now scientifically been able uh, to establish at least three virtues of LARP, which are co-creation, coherence, and community. Possibly something with communication, possibly something with contracts. And now, if you know anything about the human mind, it's very important that we're starting to see all of these start with C. <laughs> so we have to find one that does not start with C, because otherwise we're going to have like a weird bias that, that we will only have virtues that start with C in the language of English. And that's like a really stupid way of designing a religious system. You know? <laughs> yeah. I think possibly there's something about respect and trust. But those might be like underlying values, that those might be like the things that enable these, the, the, these things to exist. But from, so this thing when I'm saying contracts, like the, this agreement, the implicit agreements between in co-creation and in co-participation, that those are based somehow on respect and trust. Respect for each other as humans and artists. I mean, I'll say that separately because it's important. Respect for each other as humans and respect for each other as artists. And you may not have an identity that says, when I LARP for kicks, I am an artist. Well, sure, but in the context of that situation, you are. And we will respect your artistic contributions, or the LARP will not work. Let me not offer you a definition <laughs> of playability. So, so was everything that came up about playability, ultimately? I think, um, no, maybe. So this connects to like an ongoing theory, and what you're seeing now happening between my brain and my mouth, confusedly, is live theory. Like this is how LARP theory happens. Random people thought, talk randomly to each other, and then they think about it and try to say words. Okay. But when I was thinking about how everything is playability, what I kind of meant is that when you LARP, when we LARP, we have like a physical reality, and this, which is like something, some place where bodies are interacting. And we have social reality, which is like the players are interacting with each other, sometimes out of character and sometimes through this like added filter of character, which is like a filter that limits their agency in that situation. And then we have the fictional reality, which is what the writers are most invested in, which is like the, what is true inside the, the diegesis, inside the story. 
And if, if the heart of LARP design always is to ask, what are the verbs? What will people do in my LARP? Uh, and the second demand is that those verbs have to be uh, connected to the themes of your LARP uh, to, to be for coherence reasons and, and to create meaning. Then I think the control questions about playability on these three levels are, is it possible to do, which is, has to do with the physical like reality, does it feel possible to do without, consequ without bad consequences, which is about the social reality, and is it meaningful to do? And I think that if, that means like, if I do these actions, will it be meaningful in the context of the fiction, which then goes back to all of these levels and gives me a great LARP experience, that's where the LARP magic comes from. And what is possible, I guess possible means kind of predictably succeeding. It's not like, is it theoretical possible for one player in the universe to perform this action? No, it's like, on average, will the players at your LARP be able to do the thing you want them to do? Ideally, all of them for that specific LARP. Yeah, uh, so could we say that the playability is the virtue of LARP? or the beauty in LARP even, uh, as Bjarke tried to claim yesterday audaciously in a bar. <laughs> no, I, I'm thinking that maybe it is that, that playability, like which is when you answer yes to all of the, all of the verbs, quest, control questions in your LARP, then it's playable. Uh, and I think that's like a minimum requirement. LARPs that are not playable on all of these accounts are ugly, but there are many ways to be beautiful. There are many ways for LARPs to be beautiful, and that can be balanced in so many different ways. And though there, I think the virtues, which we have only started to look at, will be part uh, of the answer. But I think that if you are making a LARP and you're wanting it to be beautiful, I think think not only about the aesthetics of the thing that turns you on most, which might be prose, or it might be like a beautiful mechanic, or it might be like a, a wonderful workshop. We all have different things that we love most, and all of those are valid. But try to see, in addition, through this filter of community coherence and co-creation, and the other virtues, which I'm sure will not start with C, and there will be more of, uh, am I living up to those ideals? Because I think then I'm likelier uh, to succeed uh, with the LARP. Uh, I did not know any of this at 8 a.m. this morning. Thank you for teaching me the things that, that I have now told us. Please speak to each other and please teach us more. I will say thank you, but before that I will just say uh, that if you are interested in the 2019 LARP design book, if you have already bought it, please pick it up uh, in the info desk. And if you need to buy one, I think we still have some spares. Come find me in the next break. Thank you very much. <laughs>